So let me dive right in and kind of the best part is like swatching out this um, set. I'll talk about it. Um, so Derwent came out with their Ink Tense line. I'm not even sure when, but it's relatively new. And their Ink Tense colors, they started off with the, the crayons, like the watercolor uh, pencils. And I don't even have any at my desk with me. Um, but they've made them into these pan sets too, to make them a little bit more accessible um, to traditional watercolor techniques. Actually, let me just reach behind me and grab some of their Ink Tense. Uh, pencils. So everybody kind of knows about these. I think they've been uh, around for quite a long time. They're wonderful quality, but they were designed to give the look and kind of, you know, intensity of ink. Um, and with some of those, the, the qualities of a watercolor pencil. Um, and then they kind of evolved into their pan sets. And do I have an original pan set? Oh, that's a graphitant pan set. I have a collection. That's their metallics, like what came first? There's the kind of the original pan set and you can tell this one's well loved, um, but they have that ink tense color in there and they work more like traditional watercolors. Um, these are really lovely to work with. There's a few things that set them apart from traditional watercolors and I'll talk about that as we get painting. Um, but these have kind of evolved into a couple of different series that they developed. Um, the graphitants, which are a little bit newer, the metallic set, which is right here. And I love this one around Christmas. I did a de demo with uh, Above Ground that's still on their YouTube channel um, using these for Christmas to make Christmas cards. And then the graphitants, they're kind of a combination between kind of graphite um, and charcoal and traditional watercolor and do a really neat kind of hybrid product. And then the newest one is the pastel. And I don't have that set here, but a little bit more like traditional gouache. So I find that like the Derwent products are really great for taking a lot of different inspiration from different traditional materials. And they make it like really accessible to newer artists um, and they're, they're wonderful artist grade products. Um, but they've really, they offer something a little bit different than a lot of the traditional watercolors um, in just these different lines. And this is their, I think it's their newest one, the line and wash set. And it comes with these two waterproof markers, which I'll talk about in a second. And then this pan set. And the set is divided into several different colors. And I had the little chart thing somewhere. There it is. But like I said before, it's a combination of their ink tents, their graphitant, and their new pastel ones. So put them all together and they're really great for urban sketching and they all go really well together. But it's a really nice range. It's a nice competition. Comp, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Just kind of drawing a blank for words. It's a nice combination. So they're ink tense colors, like they're known to be super vibrant. They're permanent. Uh, you can use them on cloth and things, canvas as well. And then I just have to check which ones are ink tents. Where are they located? There in the palette. But they're super bright. And what sets them apart is that they're permanent. So once they dry, they don't lift. So traditional watercolors will lift. And these, once they're completely dried, are absolutely permanent. And of course, they're known for being super intense and vibrant, kind of like ink. And then what makes this specific set unique is it has these graphitite, graphitant, I can't even talk today, graphitant colors, which are kind of like a mix between those ink tense colors and traditional kind of water soluble graphite. And they have, once it dries, I'll show it a little bit closer, but just that kind of beautiful granulation. The colors are a little bit uh, more muted so this one's autumn brown. This color is port. And meadow, this one's one of my favorites. So really nice subtle green, but it's got that beautiful granulation. And then what was newer to me too is their pastel series. And they have that opacity. So this is storm gray here. And artichoke, which I can't get enough of this color. I really love this one. 
but they have that white in it. So they're kind of playing on the paper like a traditional gouache or an opaque watercolor. Oh, and I forgot ocean blue, this one right here, and Payne's gray. So I don't wanna to spend too much time. I really wanna get painting, but you can see that it's a beautiful combination. They mix really well together. So you can get some beautiful purples. And, you know, they're designed to kind of coordinate. So you get really beautiful mixtures and a really nice uh, combination of different blends. But it's a great set. And if you're an urban sketcher, um, this is like a fantastic color lot for urban sketching and just a really nice kind of set in general, whether you're an artist um, or somebody more new to art, they're fantastic. Um, and I will chat more about them kind of as we get going. But does anybody have any kind of questions? Oh. I was wondering, um, what is the light fastness setting of these colors? Um, a lot of them are light fast, but there are a handful that aren't. So you do have to look it up individually on the website. Um, I don't know if Lisa has that information. Lisa from Derwent is here, um, but most of them are, but there is a handful that aren't completely light fast. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, light fastness, for those of you that don't know, is how well a pigment will fade um, over, over the years. So there are a handful of pigments in traditional watercolor that are known for fading. And uh, a lot of um, art manufacturers then give paints a light fastness rating. So artists can know if their paints are going to fade. So for a lot of artists, that's not really a big deal. We're not hanging our work in galleries or, or selling our work. So if colors shift or fade, you know, after being in the sun for 50 years, it's not a huge deal. Um, but for some of us that are artists and that are making work for galleries, light fastness is something that we really do need to be aware of. Um, when I'm urban sketching, I never pay attention to the light fastness because those uh, paintings just end up being in a book uh, for the rest of the rest of time and they're never exposed to light. So it's something that I don't pay much attention to, but I do pay attention to the light fastness ratings when I'm doing um, pieces that I intend to sell or put in galleries or things like that. So keep that in mind as well, but it's a good, good question, absolutely. And yeah, I think Lisa just put in the chat too, there's a color chart under the pencils and that'll tell you which colors are light fast. So I think someone else asked like, do you use the pen first? or do you color it in first? And that's kind of a chicken and egg uh, kind of question. I like to color in first because sometimes I get to the end of a painting and I'm like, I love this, this doesn't need any ink. Um, but there are a lot of paintings that I do and I'm like, this is not going where I want to. And ink is this really great uh, kind of last minute technique that you can throw onto paintings and sometimes it can really save things. So this is an example of one where I painted it and you can see my lines in pencil. And I didn't add ink, but there's not a lot of definition. So without those pencil lines, you really are missing a lot of those definition. And this was a great example of something that I probably should ink. And just to give a little bit of finesse and, uh, and finishing up, but I'm gonna start painting because I don't want to run out of time. I'm gonna grab some brushes. The sets come with these really nice portable brushes, which you can use. When I'm in the studio, I kind of like to use my longer handle brushes, just I'm kind of used to it. And when I'm in the studio demonstrating, I'm so used to using my water at the side um, that I end up dipping this in the water. So I'm just gonna set this aside for the purposes of this demo and just work with my regular uh, watercolor brushes. But I'm just gonna approach this how I would a completely regular painting and kind of chat my way through it and answer questions. So what is the reason for the painter's tape? The painter's tape helps the paint keep flat and helps it not buckle. So with watercolor paper, um, this is a high quality, this is Derwent's watercolor paper as well. It's 140 pound. So it doesn't ripple much, but all watercolor paper, unless you stretch it, has a little bit of a rippling. So I use the tape there to just kind of keep it down to help um, level out some of those peaks and valleys. And the other bonus is that when I remove it, I get this beautiful crisp edge. And that's just plain tape, painter's tape. You can use washi tape anything like that. So what's nice about this set is it works with all traditional watercolor techniques. It basically works just like watercolor. You can't really, I mean, tell the, like, the difference between this technique wise. I could use it just like I would uh, traditional watercolor. So I've wet my paper. I'm gonna go through and do the wet and wet technique. 
And I'm just gonna kind of create a really light wash just to kind of unify my paintings. I love starting all my paintings like this. Urban sketches, not so much because I don't like to use as much water on the field. I like to work a little bit drier, so I tend to not do as much, but I'm just using a tiny little bit of that. That blue is super intense, so I'm really gonna water it down. But I just wanna to start to get some of that color in there. And a little bit of that purpley kind of port color. So I'm just using a wide brush and just kind of getting some color in there. It helps tone it so that that isn't just like a stark white center. But the important thing to remember is that once these paints dry, they are permanent. With watercolors, sometimes you can scrub away at the paints and lift them after, then the Derwent Intense line, you cannot. But it makes it really good for layering. And I'm an artist that uses a lot of layers and like a lot of glazes. So it's actually a really good thing for that technique. But some artists really rely on a lot more lifting and traditional techniques. Um, sometimes I will make clouds using a lifting technique and that doesn't work as well with these, but that's probably the only time I think I ever really used the lifting technique in my own work. But a little bit of that red and just kind of getting it in there, letting that layer dry. And then I'm gonna use my traditional approach where I'm building this up and building it up with layers. And that'll really help you kind of, kind of see that. There might be a few areas where I want just a little bit more white and I can lift now while it's still wet. And that's what I'm gonna do. I've got my reference photo right here. I think that's good. And I'm gonna let it dry for a second and answer some more questions. So you can see that there's still a lot of moisture on that paper and it's created beautiful blends. The colors that I've used that are the graphitant line have that granulation and that beautiful texture and that gives a lot of interest. I love granulation in a lot of my paintings. I think that I tend to use a lot more non-granulating pigments traditionally in my work, but now as I keep developing, I'm using a lot more granulation, granulating pigments, but we always find that like as, as artists our work kind of evolves and changes over time. But I think I got kind of distracted when I was answering the question, like, do I add ink first or after? Um, and that's a completely personal choice. These line markers are permanent. So once you put them on the paper, they are not gonna bleed. Um, so you could have the choice to do your outline first. I like to leave it till the last myself, or sometimes I'll do a little bit where I'll do a bit of a sketch in ink and then I finish it off in ink at the last, but it's really just a preference. There's no kind of right or wrong with that technique, but I like to see the painting as a whole before I start to add all the ink. And sometimes I'll do a lot more shading in ink and sometimes not, but I'll tailor it to um, the project. Um, Derwent also has these graphic markers, which are really nice. And these are not waterproof. So if you do go over them in watercolor after, they tend to bleed. So they're really great to use as well. Just make sure you're using them after the painting is dry. Um, but the line maker set and the ones that come with this line and wash set are waterproof. So that's something to keep in mind. And they come in a 0.3 and in a 0.8. So I'm gonna use my hair dryer really quick to dry this layer. I'm um, going this to mute myself so that I, I, you don't have to hear the, the blast of the hair dryer. So I'll be back in just a second.
So a hair dryer here is my secret weapon in the studio. Um, and there I'm just letting it dry. So someone asked if the photo and patterns are available at this class. And no, I didn't make them available. This is a photo a friend sent me and the painting that I've done a few times. Um, with the time limit, because it's only an hour, we decided to make it more of a demo. So it's more of a chatty demo than like a follow along class. So some of you might be following along and I, I love that, but I find that with the hour time period, it's too speedy. I'm a notoriously uh, speedy painter. And for most people to kind of keep up with a painting of this kind of level of detail, um, it's just a little bit too much in an hour. So it's more of a demo, but they're going to be posting it on their YouTube channel. So if you did want to kind of paint along with it at maybe a more reasonable <laughs> pace, um, you can watch it again, watch the replay on YouTube and you can pause it um, whenever you need, which is really helpful. But I'm going to go too quickly to really make it um, like a step-by-step -step class um, without probably frustrating people too much asking me to slow down. But hopefully you get kind of the idea, get a peek in at uh, my process and, uh, and kind of learn a lot about, about this particular set. So this is kind of an example of how I approach a lot of my florals. I've got this really soft um, painting that I start with. And this gives me that, um, just that softness and a bit of a, like a unifying look. And then I'm gonna go through and uh, start doing negative painting to bring this to life and, and bring it together a little bit more. So someone asked, "Is are these colors permanent? Yep, they're permanent. And once they're dry, they're not going anywhere. So I'm mixing kind of two colors. I'm mixing that blue and my new favorite color artichoke right here. And I'm going to start to paint in and around all these lily pads. And then this is going to create a negative painting and start to bring the painting to life. So I'm doing a bit of charging here where I'm charging the color into that wet mix, adding a little bit of that green as well. I'm kind of trying to paint intuitively, trying to find that balance between realism and, uh, and being expressive and impressionist painting. And that's kind of, I think, my approach in a lot of my work. I wanted to ask the uh, waterproof marker, how many colors do they come in? I think they only come in black. Um, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's, yeah, the line makers that she's using that come with the line and wash set, they're, they are a pack of six. Um, they're all black, but they have different um, nib sizes. Um, but in the line maker as well, we do have a color set that has five colors in it. Color ones are nice too, if you want a bit of a softer look. I always default to black, so. Good question. So negative painting is, when we talk about negative shapes, we mean the shapes kind of around. So the, the lily here would be the positive shape and the shapes around there are considered the negative shapes. And if you Google negative painting, it's a really popular and really beautiful technique in watercolor, something I've been experimenting with a lot lately. But when we're painting flowers like this that are white, it's really important that we're leaving the white of the paper because even with these gouache colors that have that opacity, we can never get the white back after we layer on. So important to use these colors kind of around those spaces. But it's always kind of magical once you start filling in around how the, the painting kind of takes shape without doing much. And I love that mix too. So when you let things dry on their own, instead of using the hair dryer, you get really beautiful kind of dances between the colors. 
So there I've just kind of put that blend of that color in and I'll grab some red just to kind of dot in there. Gives me kind of a, just some more interest. And I can keep going back and layering. I'm gonna grab a little bit of that purple. And then this technique is called charging. So I'm charging the color in. And just like traditional kind of watercolor, those pigments will kind of sit on the paper. And if you have excess water, as it dries, they can kind of push those pigments around and you'll get things like blooms and watercolor. Um, blooms and sometimes we call them cauliflowers. So I'm taking my brush here and just dipping it into any areas where there's excess water. But the painting itself has kind of started to develop. It always kind of feels like, you know, I used to work in the dark room a lot in university. And I always, this always reminds me of that process where you put the, the you know, you expose your paper and then you put it into all the chemicals and then that whole image just, you know, appears in front of you. And at this stage, that always kind of reminds me of that process. So I do want to let that dry. So instead of bringing out my hair dryer, I'm going to start in the center here. Make sure that I'm doing these color mixes on camera here. I squish this over. Perfect. You can really see what I'm doing. So I'm taking a bit of that yellow, super vibrant. I'm going to add a little bit of water. And I just want to create kind of a really loose suggestion of the center here. Areas like this, um, where there's so much detail, let me look at my reference photo here. The only way to really kind of create this in watercolor um, is to really look at the, the values and to really create a lot of shading within here. And that becomes really difficult, especially when this size, like this level of detail too is quite a challenge. And if you think about paintings by like Georgia O'Keeffe, where there's a lot of detail in the center of flowers, they're quite huge. So her paintings are, you know, like two feet by three feet. And we always kind of forget that. I mean, I sure do. And then I'm trying to sometimes create a tiny painting and wondering like, why is this like a nightmare to get all the detail in the center? And like, it's because of just, you know, physical dexterity, just, you know, creating that many variations in tone and value in such a small space. is just, it's just really tricky. You know, you have to get out that tiny, like, you know, brush with like one hair in it and start to build up that color and it's, it's, it can be very difficult. So like, you know, even like myself as kind of a professional painter and someone who's paints a lot of florals, these details become like really like the bane of your existence after a while to try to get that perfect rendering um, in something like this, especially in yellow. Like, I don't know what it is about yellow but creating variations in tone in yellow I think is the most difficult but maybe that's just me. Uh, let me know if you're, if you find that as well. I'm going to just kind of scroll down and see if there's any more questions. But the nice thing about using the ink and wash technique is that I'm using it as a shortcut. I don't have to create all those picture perfect changes in value and gradation because the ink outline is going to tell the story for me. It's going to bridge that gap. So I'm using this dark mango color. And I think of all like the ink tents colors. This gets the most mileage for me. I love this mango color. It's like a really warm, almost orangey yellow, but then it's creating a little bit of a gradient too. And then I'll go back in and add those details with the pen. Do I want to go any darker in the center? I can add a little bit of that poppy red, maybe a little bit. Yeah, so I, I'm a notoriously fast painter. When I am in the studio, I do find that I take a little bit longer but I am kind of speedily kind of going through here. But I'd say I'm kind of a notorious fast painter. Paint's still a little bit wet. I'm gonna blast it with my hair dryer. 
mute again. So this is where those graphitants really shine. Like, do you see that granulation, that beautiful texture? If you're somebody that likes texture in your work, that's, that's really exciting. Some people don't like as much texture, but the way it kind of plays in the color. And when we say granulation um, with watercolor, we just basically mean that all the pigments um, kind of settle into the paper and give you that kind of salt and pepper texture. And it just creates a really nice effect. So checking dryness, and most of it's pretty dry. I'm gonna go in, I'm still using my number eight brush. Actually, it's not a number eight, it's a number 10. I tend to try to use a number eight or a 10 for the majority of a painting. And then I only kind of go down to the smaller sizes, kind of as I'm just putting the final details on. And I'm working pretty small. So if you're finding that you're um, painting and that there's a lot of water deposited on your paper, it might be a sign that you need to downsize your brush. So use a smaller brush. But for painting this size, oops, eight or 10 is, is just about perfect for me. Someone asked, does it matter if you start with the negative painting first versus the center? Um, in this particular one, not at all, because they're, they're kind of sectioned off. So the negative painting was really around the flower. And, you know, if you're not feeling super confident um, with your watercolors, um, that might be a good thing to do, because once you've invested all that time in like the outside, then if you make a mistake kind of on the inside, it's super heartbreaking because it's kind of, you know, that sunken cost. So if, depending on your approach, um, if you're not feeling super kind of confident that you're going to nail the, the center in one go um you might want to do that first and then you know if you kind of if it doesn't go your way which you know happens in watercolor then you don't have to kind of worry about it some artists will use the negative painting technique um as a whole and really it's a beautiful style um there's a few artists that are really known for their negative painting technique there's a good book on negative painting too um i think it's by linda kemp and it's just about negative painting in general and some artists will use that technique um, as a complete whole and build up their negative painting. And in that case, it matters. But I'm kind of just cherry picking a little bit. I'm just using the negative technique um, in some areas around the outside. So for me, in this painting, or something like this, doesn't really matter. You can do it last, absolutely, because these are sectioned. But I would say in a traditional, if you're using the traditional negative painting technique, then you, you'll build up the whole thing in one go. And it's a bit of a different ball game, technique wise. So I'm mixing together. I like to always mix a few colors in every um, kind of area. So that helps me create an interesting painting. Um, and it helps me, especially with line and wash, to create something that doesn't look like I've just colored in a coloring book. It would be really easy for me to mix, you know, like one green, and I'll just kind of do it over here as an example and just kind of paint this lily pad green and this lily pad, you know, light green or dark green. And that's an interesting technique. There's nothing wrong with that, but I wanna make each lily pad as interesting as possible. And I wanna tell a story with color and experiment. So you can see that part of the variation in color is because I've layered, that layer underneath is peeking through. And then the other part is because I'm using all my colors together to just kind of blend and create a really varied look. And this line set too, you don't have to worry about 
uh, creating kind of mud or, or kind of gross color mixes because they've been like hand selected to look good together. So when I'm throwing in this color, this color and this color, like they all look great together, they blend together, they play well together. And that's, that's kind of the benefit of having like a set like that. You don't have to kind of do all the color tests and, and, uh, and kind of all the work to say like, okay, is this going to color play with well with this color? Um, that as watercolor artists can take a long time to kind of really learn. But when you have a set like this, all the colors play well together. And it, just, it does create a really good look. I'm being a little bit looser in this painting. Not worried too much about accuracy. But yeah, if you are in the chat, let me know if we would do ink first or watercolor first. Wish we could do a vote, I'm curious. Both methods work. I'm team watercolor first. But if you use this technique or are familiar with watercolor, let me know if, which one you would do first. There's no wrong answers. Someone says, I didn't know you could do ink first. Yeah, as long as you have a waterproof pen, you can ink first. Sometimes if you wanna loosen up your watercolor and if you struggle with that, doing ink first can help because if you have a really tight ink drawing, then some of us, there's something about being able to be a little bit looser as we paint because that drawing's there. I don't have to worry about getting things accurately, but some artists find that if their ink drawing is already there, the drawing is nailed down that they can be a little bit looser with their watercolor. And if you're someone that struggles with looseness in your watercolor, that might be something to give a, to give a try to. Because it's like, I don't have to think about this petal and this petal and this petal and this petal. They're already there. The ink is, is doing that. I love these colors together. It's funny, when I started as an artist, I used really vibrant colors. And I got the original pan set. I love them. They're pure colors. A lot of the, like, they don't granulate as much as the graph for graphitants. And that was like my style. I love that. I couldn't get enough of it. And then now, like the last two years in my watercolor practice, it's like, I've just discovered uh, colors like this, like this artichoke color. You'd never see me use it two years ago because I was, uh, I would use high chroma, super bright colors. I don't know. Maybe I'm just, you know, getting tamer in my old age, old age. <laughs> but I'm starting to kind of love these like soft muted colors. So like them together. And it's, it's exciting to, I talk a lot in my classes about experimenting with different palettes. And when you're a beginner, you tend to use those primary colors, those regular colors. But then this is like a whole different ball game. And you see a lot of beautiful stylistic work and a lot of artists have kind of signature colors and learning about, you know, palettes, what colors go well together is like such an important part of your journey. And if you're in that rut where you're always using, you know, what I call like a CMY color palette, cyan, magenta, and yellow color palette, um, and you're mixing kind of very um, textbook colors, Getting a set like this and saying like, okay, it's a whole month. I'm going to do nothing but paint with these colors. It gets you so much out of your comfort zone because a lot of us maybe wouldn't automatically gravitate to these colors, or maybe you do. Um, but trying these together and really kind of digging in and experimenting with this particular set helps you learn so much as an artist. Because when I'm going to mix a green, you know, you have those automatic greens that a lot of us use you know you'll have that automatic okay I always mix green with this and this um, and then having a color like this it's like oh well now I can mix a green with this and this um, if you're newer to watercolor uh, unconventional green is to take a Payne's gray 
whoops, and I'm using it off camera so you can't see. A Payne's gray, and it's a beautiful bluey gray, and mix it with yellow. So you think, okay, we're we're pros, like we all know that yellow plus blue makes green, but yellow and gray makes green. I mean, it's because it's a bluey gray, but it makes a beautiful green and nobody thinks about that. So try it out. Um, Payne's gray is a color that most of us have. But it makes some olivey, like more natural greens. Because sometimes you get into that um, rut where you're always taking like a yellow and mixing it with a blue and you're getting like a perfect, very specific greeny green, you know, for lack of a better word, but you're not really getting a green that looks like something you'd find in nature. So this is, you know, like a standard kind of blue in here. So like a beautiful green, but if I'm painting kind of flowers or things like that, if I'm painting a landscape, like this is where I want to be. So that Payne's gray trick is a, is a really fun way to make green. And like this has two greens, but if I didn't want to go with this one, so if I didn't want this one, and if I didn't want this one, I've got this beautiful pure yellow and that Payne's gray. Yeah, just as an example of how many different greens can I get with one palette? And with this particular palette, you can get like 100. So there in the paint's gray, there in that intense blue. This is their ocean graphitant color. That with our yellow. So, so many different ways to make green. Endless possibilities. I love that because, like, you know, as a, someone that paints landscapes and florals, it's all about the greens. Someone's written in the comment reassurance and the colors in the set have been chosen to go together. Color isn't my comfort zone. That is so true for a lot of people. And if you're newer to watercolor, it's like, I feel like there's like five techniques that you learn in watercolor. You know, you learn your wet and wet, you learn your washes, you learn this. And then uh, once you get those five techniques down, the rest of the way is color theory. And that's also the hardest part. So color theory is just like, you know, a rabbit hole. Like you start with like learning how to mix, you know, your basics and then you learn your neutrals. And then it's just, you never stop learning color theory. But anyways, looking at the time, I'm going to make sure that I keep going because I'm getting sidetracked story of my life. And I'm going to start to build up those colors inside. And again, I'm going to rely on that ink and wash to really get those details. So if I was painting this with super detailed, you know, realism, this would be where I would need like, you know, a couple of hours. But I'm using those pens as a shortcut. Taking a bit of that port color and I'm just popping in to the shadows. But yeah, if you're struggling with color theory, sometimes people, and I find this a lot in my students, to get overwhelmed because they have bought every color in the rainbow and don't know where to start. Well, what color should I use to mix this? And what color should I use to mix that? The best thing you can do to really learn color theory is to grab one set, you know, pick one limited palette and kind of sink your teeth into it and, and say like, okay, for like six months, I'm only gonna use these colors and you are gonna learn so much, but sometimes you get overwhelmed with every color in the rainbow. And you're, and you know, I hear this all the time, like, why am I making mud? Why aren't these colors going well together? And it's because color theory is, you know, like a six month course. And, uh, you know, I teach color theory in my beginner class. And uh, 
you know, in two nights. <laughs> it's just like, I'm just not even covering, barely covering the basics in color theory. There's so much to learn. I started watercolor relatively recently, I think only about seven years ago, but I have a degree from the University of Guelph and in a photography background. So I feel like I learned watercolor kind of quickly, but it's because I had that, um, that background in color theory that really applied really well. And I've had a student um, that just was amazing at the color theory and amazing at selecting colors. And, uh, and I found out that she had a quilting background and that made so much sense because you're so used to looking at color and you know trained in color theory and all that helped um, her color theory with watercolor. And I found that kind of interesting. Well, um, I wanted to ask what causes colors to look muddy? When you mix complementary colors together, they cancel each other out. So with that knowledge, the colors you choose um, really matter. So let me grab a little scrap of paper here. So if I was mixing uh, yellow and, and complementary color opposite on the color wheel is purple. And let me grab a purple here. I want it to be clear, so I'm grabbing a purple from my other set here. And uh, when I mix them together, they make mud because they're complementary colors. So this is a great way to learn how to make grays and make neutrals. But what you find is that if colors are too, kind of too close to being complements, they kind of start to create mud. So a good example is when I'm making purple. This is that poppy red. And, you know, this is if you're looking at a color wheel, handy dandy color wheel to the rescue. If you're looking at a color wheel and I'm looking at yellow right across is purple, but so that's the complementary color. Sorry, I'm thinking backwards. If I'm looking at red, sorry about that. Red and green are complementary colors. Orange and blue are complementary colors, um, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So this poppy red, if I look at the opposite, it's kind of a green. If I mix that red with this kind of blue that's a little bit greeny. You think, am I gonna get purple? Yeah, but I'm getting kind of like a muddy purple. If I take a pinky red, like this magenta color and mix it with that same blue. I'm getting like a royal purple that's really not muddy at all. That is a crisp kind of beautiful purple. So when you start mixing colors that are complementary colors, you start to get a lot of muddy colors. So by selecting kind of one kind of wrong color, you can start to build up colors that get really muddy. And if you look at the color selection that we have here, they're generally cooler and uh, they just, they all play well together. So they all are kind of, it's a bit of an analogous color palette where they're all kind of close to each other. They're all cool. They're all blue. And then the only warm colors are kind of up here. So when they play together, do you see how they're all kind of in that same kind of color area? You know, you mix them together and you still are getting really nice neutrals instead of like gross, icky, kind of muddy colors. So I feel like that was a really like lightning quick answer, but it's color theory. <laughs> That's Thanks also so like much. something that I could talk about for, you know, days. So I'm just taking a look at my reference photo. Just getting a little bit more 
the darkness here. And then I'm going to dry it quickly and add the ink and I will chat about the ink part. All right, now the good part. So the set comes with the 0.3 and the 0.8. And you can see that that's a really nice chunky line. And this 0.3 is, I think, kind of about the perfect, perfect size for a lot of the, the work that I do, especially florals. Um, but you can buy the whole range as well. But this is pretty versatile kind of section. And, uh, and I'm just going to kind of go in and start to grab my reference photo here. and start to outline. But do you see that I haven't done a lot of work here, but done just enough to suggest that some of the flowers are in shadow. And the line is just gonna fill in all those details and tell the rest of the story. So do make sure that everything's completely dry before you start going in. But I'm also, you know, you don't want to add lines that aren't there, but something that I tell my students when I do ink and wash is there's no lines in real life. If you look at the world around you, nothing has an outline. So this is really a tool that we're using to tell the story. So we don't want to think about it like a coloring book with a big thick outline around every kind of plane. We really wanna think about this line as filling in the gaps for the viewer and telling a story. So I've used this bit of broken line. I'm not necessarily keeping it super accurate. I can be a little bit more expressive in my line. You can also start to incorporate traditional drawing techniques to create more depth. So if I wanted a little bit of shadow here, lines like, this is called hatching. And you probably know this, but cross hatching is then when you go like this. And that's a way to kind of create shadows. That's a traditional kind of drawing technique. But do you see how it starts to fill in those gaps and tell the story? Um, don't ever outline a shadow. I think that's my one rule. If you're taking notes, that's the highlight. Don't underline this, don't outline the shadows. But you can add texture as well, depending on your style. So if you really start looking at like children's books too, a lot of children's books are watercolor and ink and beautiful illustrations. And then you have that basic watercolor and then you can add texture and line. So, and then this is where you can really impart your own style too. You could be really loose with your lines. Um, like when I said a broken line, I mean, one that doesn't kind of fill in all the way. And add just some texture. Uh, so when we use the dots, it's called stippling. And it can just give us some, you know, extra excitement here. And then you can really look at, okay, this is all dried. These are waterproof. Is there anywhere that I wanna add a little extra attention? And I wanna just go in and put a little bit of a shadow 
just under some of these lily pads. So I'm taking a bit of that blue. This is a really nice shadow color. I want to neutralize it, so I'm adding a little bit of that purpley color. Oops, I missed a section. There we go, that's better. Adding that. And then I'm softening, so I rinsed my brush. Just creating a bit of a softening technique underneath that. But it's really up to you at this point if you think, okay, you know what, this needs a little bit more purple. You know, do I want to go back in there and fix it up? And this is where you can. But it's a great technique. It creates something, you know, very stylistic. It looks like a children's illustration. Um, very versatile. But I will admit that I use the ink technique to save a lot of paintings because if I'm getting to the middle of this and I'm thinking, I'm not telling this story. Um, I can't really tell what's going on here. Um, and if a student of mine is having a painting that's just like, you know, off the rails, like add ink, because if your painting's already kind of, you know, one of those paintings that's gonna end up in the trash, you might be able to save it with ink. So give that a shot before you throw out any paintings. Someone said what neutralizing does. Um, by, I don't know, did I say, I said neutralizing, but I just meant softening the edges. So this has got a hard edge. And since the ink tense paints are permanent, I can't go back and kind of scrub those out or soften them. So as it's wet, I just take a damp brush and I just go along that edge and I soften that edge just to kind of create a subtle blend. So here, if I don't do that, I get that hard edge, which isn't a bad look, but softening that edge just helps like make it less uh, like attention grabbing. Perfect. And I like the thick for stippling. So if you're doing a lot of work with stippling, using the thick and the thin together can give you a little bit more dimension so it doesn't look um, like it's computerized. I do like that. Also having one of these micro, like these, uh, these line markers to sign is really nice because everybody knows it's kind of a, a disaster to sign in watercolor with your brush. But they're nice to sign in as well. And then for whoever asked about the masking tape. That beautiful border, that's like the best part. So depending on like your color set too. So, you know, this is one that I did earlier with a different color palette. I could talk color palettes all day. Um, you get a different look. Like this is a really beautiful muted tones. A lot of my work is like easing towards these kind of color values. Um, but there's no right or wrong answer. So if you use any of like the Derwent sets, I mean, or any watercolors in general, um, you can get totally different looks using the same painting. So, um, you know, keep that in mind too, is that the colors that you choose will really impact the final result. So this is using kind of a full rainbow. And then this is using that set. And because it has that curated selection of colors, it's all really unified. It's got that beautiful, um, tone and uh, and that's to me like that's a huge benefit to using a set like this so we can open up to questions i can even you can even spotlight both cameras so i can see people face to face The masking tape's nice. Sometimes I'll use a full sheet and then I have that excess around here. Candace, there's one question. It says, um, is there time for a quick demo on how you use the water-filled brush in the field? There sure is. If I can find my water brush. Where did I put it? Okay, it's right here. So the one thing you got to remember is they screw on the opposite way. 
And that's so that when, if you're right-handed, because you know the world's made for people that are right-handed, um, you're not slowly uh, kind of unscrewing it. So it's kind of opposite. Um, this one's full. Do I have an empty one? I have a stash. They're all full. Okay. Oh, here's one. Here's one that isn't full. So unscrewing it. There we go. And, uh, and then it has this body of water. So if I was in the field, I usually bring my water in a water bottle like this. And then you fill her up. It's best done under the sink. Like that's ideal. If you can fill them up before you go. Oh, I rarely do it without spilling. Let's just get this out of the way there. Especially on camera. And then you kind of put it in. I've seen people fill these with ink too um, and create like brush calligraphy and things like that. It's a good tool for that. And if you like a more of a variety, the set comes with the little guys, but Joanne has these ones. Ugh. This one's of course, I'm a sloppy artist. <laughs> they're like, they're not clean from the last time I used them, but um, it has a variety of different brush tips as well and different sets as well. And they're really nice. Great for travel, for plein air painting, which I do a ton of. The nylon will stain with all of the brushes, but it won't, uh, it won't stay. So I can use it again and all that. This is just stained. That happens with all the nylon brushes. But then squeezing a little bit out. You could use like a syringe or something like that if you don't have that kind of if you struggle with pouring things into a tiny little surface but my suggestion is using a bottle like this or you can just dunk it right into the stream but yeah did that answer your question this is nice always having it in here i like it for your purse keep in mind too that because these are permanent and they do work on cloth I love plein air painting and urban sketching, but if you do put this kit in your purse, it's gonna permanently, if it, any leaks out, it's not watertight um, and gets on your purse, that is super permanent. So, and keep that in mind about your clothes. So um, some watercolors wash out and you know, with uh, traditional watercolors, it can be a little bit hit and miss uh, for washability, but the ink tends to make sure you don't get it on any fabric because it's gonna be there to stay forever. How to use the sponge. Oh, I didn't even talk about the sponge, I'm sorry. So the sponge is when I'm out in the field and I don't have my rag, I get to dry it off so I can control the water using that sponge. And I never use it in the, in the studio because I'm in the habit of having my rag right beside me. It's all muscle memory. I go here, 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 which is why I never demonstrate with these because my muscle memory, when I'm in the studio, I'm rinsing it in my water instead of you know, using the this. But when you're in the field, you would kind of get it out, do this, you know, kind of maybe you rinse it off. And then if you don't want to have a ton of color, that just soaks up that excess. And it helps kind of control the water a little bit better. But the nylon brushes, they are really handy, but they don't control the water as well as a traditional brush. So when I'm in the studio, I use a traditional brush, but you know, these, you can't beat them for portability and ease of use and things like that. So they're greater uh, for on the field or out and about, or if you just want a tiny setup, like sometimes you don't want to have all your brushes out. It's just like a little way to get going. But uh, yeah, if you really rely on a lot of water control, um, using a traditional brush is, is maybe better, but it's nice because it's always there. So that when you are traveling, you always have a brush handy. But yeah, that's what that sponge is for. It replaces this. I have a friend that does a lot of urban sketching and she takes a sock, cuts the top off and, uh, and puts it on her wrist so that when she's painting and she needs to dab, instead of having a sponge, she uses the sock on her wrist. And it's kind of my favorite urban sketching on location hack is an old sock. And these you can take out too and you can clean or if you've used it for years um, and they're really 
dirty, you could just cut a piece of sponge to stick in there or some paper towel. These two, when you use them, you can still, this is such a nice travel kit. I'm, I'm getting sidelined again. Um, but when you're done with the colors, so if I, I don't wanna wreck this one, you can pop them out and then fill them up again too. Yeah, the pastels are so fun. Gouache in general is becoming really kind of trendy in the art world. Um, so it's really nice that they have this set as, as well. And it's nice because you can layer it with that opacity. And if you aren't good at saving the whites in watercolor, um, having those with a little bit of white in it is really nice. And it's that's kind of a new technique to me too, because I was taught really traditionally where it was like, we don't use white in watercolor, we use the white of the paper and we build up transparent layers. And a lot of old school watercolor artists really stick to their guns there. But adding colors with that white, it's just so beautiful for trees, for mosses, and to get more like matte colors. It's such a nice technique. It's just a game changer um, to use these opaque colors. And I definitely got to grab the, the pastel set too, because it has this really nice pink in it that I really want. Because getting pink in watercolor is tricky. You really need to have that white pigment to make like a really like, you know, pink, pink. What would I use the Inktense pencils for? Oh my gosh, what? They are so great. Um, so they create a really good fine line. I'm running out of paper for demos. So for brushwork, let me grab thing here. Anything that needs a fine line, this is a dream. They're super intense too. And like Derwin has the regular watercolor pencils too. They're a little softer, um, but the ink tense line is super intense. So if I was painting, um, you know, this is just a leaf, but to get these like lines, to do it with a pencil, so great. Um, to sign your work, instead of using traditional watercolor, if you didn't want to use pen, um, even to, you can use these to create a palette. So these you can buy individually. So if there's you know a couple of colors that you want, and if you want to use them in your watercolors as well, you can put them down like that and create, where'd my brush go? Oh, there we go. And pick up that color and then just use it like you would traditional watercolors. So when I'm trying to save space um, in my plein air kit, sometimes I'll just, uh, if I'm like doing like a really intense camping trip, I'll create a little flat palette that I'll just stick in my booklet using the ink tents like this. And it's literally like paper thin, but all that color that you deposit, you can pick up again, but it's great for details. This version I did for a previous demo is done just with the pencils. So pencils have a little bit of a different look but where they really shine is that range. Like they have like a hundred different colors. So there's tons of them. They're super portable. If you're new to watercolor, they're a nice like get into watercolor, good for cards. Um, love these. And they come in blocks too. So if you like uh, making work that's a little bit more chunky, they have blocks too. I have them somewhere getting a little scattered. I have like all my supplies out now and my desk is now chaos at the end of the demo, but they have watercolor blocks and things like that too. But um, I really like the traditional kind of feel of watercolor. So the pan sets, they're my favorite. And if you like the muted colors too, the graphitint set is really nice. Oops, that's not it. But yeah, I could talk about them all day. I'm getting distracted. <laughs> But yeah. So yeah, if anybody has any more questions, definitely you can reach out on social media too. And I think they, yeah, they'll have the video again that's replayable up on YouTube. But yeah, anything we should add? <laughs> Are there any more questions from anyone? I had a question in the chat. 
Yeah, this, can you draw something with pencils and then even 10 days later colorize them? Yes. I don't know if there's ever like a deadline, like if it would ever not um, activate. So when you add water, it activates. I've never had it sit around for more than 10 days. I don't see why you couldn't leave it for an extended period. But there might be like, you know, if you kept it unactivated for a year, it might not activate. I couldn't tell you that, but I don't see why not. Um, and it is nice if they're they're more portable, if you don't want to get out, you know, if you don't want your desk to look like this, having the watercolor pencils is sometimes a nice little way to get creative without, you know, diving in without having to have a, a studio. Yeah, so it was really great painting with you. And if you have painted along too, tag me on social. I want to see it. I'd love to see it.